I was seeking the Holy Spirit this week. What he wanted me to share. And in the first chapter of Samuel, chapter 30 and verse 6, we read these words. And David was greatly distressed. I don't know about you if you ever get like that. I think all human beings do at times. We feel distressed, be it that we're disappointed or discouraged or, or taken back by something. And these words really stuck out to me. And David was greatly distressed. This is the great man of God that we all know. As a matter of fact, this is after David has been anointed by Samuel. So, it tells me it does not matter how great an anointing is on your life or what your calling is or who you are in God, that these things can still happen. They can still attack us. And it, it says, First Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6, And David was greatly distressed. And see, David is just rushed into forming an alliance with a king from a pagan people prior to this being distressed. Actually, this was the enemy of Israel. We all know the story of David and Goliath. This was the king of Gath and the Philistines. And David has just made an alliance with them because he's running from Saul. He's hiding from Saul. And so he goes and hides out with the enemy of Israel. A kind of dumb thing to do. But we do do dumb things at times. And so by doing so, he's violating God's commands out of the book of Leviticus. And instead of seeking God for an answer to his problem, which he thought was Saul, he goes and hides out with the enemy, actually to fight against his own people, which to me is kind of dumb also. The church, often we're often good at that, of fighting against each other. I kind of watch the chickens have a little squabble, and that reminds me of the church sometimes, how we squabble amongst each other. And David has formed this alliance, and he's violated God's commands. Instead of seeking the one that God had placed over David, which of course was Samuel the prophet, or seeking God himself, he just goes ahead and does his own thing thinking he's doing the right thing. And so he partners with this king of the Philistine army. And what's crazy about this is not so long ago he's just taken out Goliath and his brothers who were their head soldiers. So it's kind of a crazy story. And it takes a catastrophe for David to correct his foolishness and reverse what he's done. And David does what so many of us have done and maybe will do and I hope not. Not sought guidance or direction, firstly from God and secondly from the brethren that we fellowship with. David chose to override those principles and believed he was doing the right thing. David returns from his travels from being with this pagan army, eager to get back to his wife, family, and children. And he finds that they are no longer there, and the whole city is being destroyed, the city of Ziglag. As a matter of fact, there's no one there. There's no wives, there's no children. And this is when we read these words and David was greatly distressed. How could it happen to such a great man of God? How could... David believed he was living right before God and I think there's a lesson here for each one of us. Sometimes we think we're living right and we're not. Sometimes we think we're walking in faith and we're not. And David thinks he's living right with God. He's just been anointed by Samuel, so isn't that enough evidence to say he's the man? That's what David thinks. 
And yet God seems to allow this tragedy to happen and we know that nothing in life happens without God's allowing it to happen. How many of us think we're right with God and we make decisions based on what we believe when in fact we've not heard from God? I'm the first one to put my hand up there. I've done that many times. David had not sought counsel he had gone it alone, dragging along with him 600 men. But you see, he didn't only drag 600 men along, he dragged 600 men and their families because although their families were not with him, the decision David made affected those 600 families. And every one of us, whether we're all leaders in the kingdom of God, every one of us, our decisions affect a far greater sphere than just ourselves. Mm -hmm. And here David thinks he can make decisions for all these people without seeking God. And his sin costs all those men and their families. Anyone who's not taken direction from God will not only harm their own life, but will harm others' lives. I've got to admit, the, this week I've had some things happen that have caused me distress. Not distress in myself for something I've done, but distress about other people. You may have too. Decisions that they make. And I'm sure when David woke up that morning before this happened, he, like most of us, prayed to the God of heaven. He might have read his word for the day. You know, he might have spent half an hour praying in the Spirit. I'm sure David would have. I don't think David would have neglected praying to God. But he didn't seek God over this decision. And how can this man of God have missed it so much? When we try to solve our problems by ourselves and our own strength, we violate God's word. And Jesus said, I only do that which I see my Father do. What that means for us is I only do what God's word says. That's simplifying it. The saving grace of this whole tragedy is David was humble enough. And that's why God said David is a man after my own heart because of the humility of this man. When he sinned, he was willing to admit it. And in, in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1, I love these words. David says, What have I done? What is my iniquity? What is my sin? It's the cry of David as he soul searches himself. How could this have happened to me? It's a good backdrop for us to hold fast to in our own life when things are not going the way we expect them to go. What have I done? What, what is my iniquity? We've always got to look first in the mirror before we start looking at other things as the cause or the reason. And often we don't. Often we want to look at the circumstances rather than look in the mirror at ourselves. David, 600 men, exhausted and distressed, lay the blame at the feet of David, and rightfully so, I believe so. David's been anointed to do this job and he's not meant to act without the direction of God. I believe that applies to each one of us. I believe every decision we make, every decision, can help or hinder somebody's life, can harm or bless somebody's life. And the saying, hurt people, hurt people, is so true. I don't know if you've heard that before. I'll say it again. Hurt people hurt people. A person who's hurting in themselves is going to hurt others. Whenever you get someone in your midst or in our midst and they're carrying hurts, that hurt's going to spill over and cause hurt to someone else. So true it was in this case. These guys want to lay the blame on their leader. And when the crisis passes, 
and the hurt has subsided, then this fences have to be mended again with those that have been hurt. And sadly, some people never attempt to mend the fences. They just carry on. The fences they've torn down, they continue to go through life hurting more and more and more people. And now the men that are there to serve David unto death, they want to kill him. They want to kill him. And David's response was not one of retaliation, but is the focus of what I want to share today. The Bible says, but David encouraged himself mm-hmm. in the Lord. Mm-hmm. One of the most powerful verses, I believe, in the whole Bible. When you're feeling discouraged, when you don't have an answer, when someone may have inflicted pain or hurt on your life, there's two things you can do. You can dwell on it and focus on it, or you can encourage yourself in the Lord. David encouraged himself in the Lord, the Bible says. Maybe this is the most eloquent but, but David, but David encouraged himself because, maybe it's the most eloquent but in the whole of the Bible, because David has lost as much as anybody else here. <laughs> he's lost every, the only thing he's got left are the clothes that are on his back. He's lost his house, he's lost his wife, lost his children, lost his riches. Everything's been taken by the Amalekites. And at the time, David doesn't know it's the Amalekites. He thinks it's Saul and his crew. We have two choices at these times. We look at the problem, we dwell on it. Or we look deep within ourselves and we draw from the one that's within us. Mm -hmm. I think of our brother in prison. I often think of him, the experiences that he had and is going through. What more can you do at a time like that but draw from the world from deep within yourself and this is when we can only say what the father says it is written it is written this is when those who are escaping the Lord's hand want to blame the devil we've had them in our midst those who want to escape the Lord's hand when God is working on someone's life and that person runs, the easiest way out of it is to blame the devil. It's easy to blame the demons. It's easy to blame the devil. Not realizing that God is trying to work on your life and bring the necessary change. There has to be an intentional discipline at these times when we lay hold of the promises that God has given us and remind ourselves, we literally need to get ourselves by the ear and say, get your act together. Mm -hmm. This is what the Word of God says. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Forget about sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so. This is what the Word of God says. The psalmist reveals this in Psalm 43, verse 5. As he sternly has a talking to himself. Mm-hmm. I don't know about you. Sometimes I do this, and if you could hear me, you'd probably think I'm crazy. Sometimes I chastise myself in my bedroom or wherever I am. And this is what the psalmist does. Why are you cast down? <laughs> Get yourself together, in other words. Why are you cast down? Oh, my soul, your mind. Why are you so worried? <laughs> yeah? Hope in God, for I shall... Yet praise him. This is what the psalmist says when he's down. The help of my countenance is my God. <laughs> Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Huh? There is a song we used to sing years and years ago. I don't know if you know the song. It goes, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. Let's never forget that. 
When someone says, oh, I can feel the demons around, well, they've got to flee, the Bible says. The greater one's in you. Huh? The greater one's in you. There's nothing passive about serving God when things don't go the way we hope they'll go. We have to remain strong. Rather, we need to take hold of ourselves and give ourselves a stern talking to. Hmm? At times in our lives, we can feel overloaded with the cares of the world. I don't know. Am I the only one who feels that? <laughs> huh? I sort of hit a wall this week. I was just exhausted with physical work, mental whatever, spiritual attacks. You know, it's a culmination of everything happening at once. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Sometimes you just feel that overload and that. They've just got a way of edging themselves in and bringing with themselves the sense of hopelessness. And I found it necessary when this happens to preach to myself. We need to learn the art of preaching to ourselves. My mother was an expert at this. To the point, you could think she's crazy. She could be in a supermarket and she's preaching to herself. We need, all of us need to learn to preach to ourselves. The pastor behind the pulpit, the evangelist on the street corner are not exempt from living out the message they bring. <laughs> we all have to live this message. There are times we fold up the Superman cape we're wearing and we put it in a drawer for a while and we admit, we admit to ourselves just how we're feeling. And then it's time to encourage ourselves. It's time to encourage ourselves in the Lord. It's one thing to preach or teach to others. It's another thing to do it to yourself. <laughs> yes. uh, you know, years ago I used to put the preachers on the platform, and especially those who could draw a big crowd. And then I learned well, it, was, it wasn't that hard when I was in the Philippines. Big crowds come, so that sort of squashed that thing. But I used to put them up there on this pedestal thinking, they've got no problems, it's not perfect. It's just us who have got the problems. <laughs> but the truth is, that's not true. Huh? That's not true. We need to encourage ourselves in the Lord. The Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. Well, that's a way of saying David preached to himself. David preached to himself. And the day came when the disciples were to have a post-resurrection encounter with the Lord. I love this. This is after the Lord has risen. He's about to ascend into heaven permanently and leave earth. And he tells the disciples, meet me in such and such a mountaintop, somewhere in Galilee it is. And so they, they turn up there. Some of them were suspicious. And they turn up there. They've spent three years following Jesus around the nation we know as Israel, a, a relatively small area. We, we get this picture of Jesus has traveled all around the world and he's done all the... No, Jesus only traveled an area of about 50 miles. That's it. Geographically, about 50 miles. That's the area that Jesus worked in. These disciples have traveled that back and forth, back and forth with Jesus. When I talk about he's only traveled 50 miles, I mean, I don't mean in his entire life here. I'm talking about the geographical area that he worked in. Yeah, yeah. Of course, modern transp transportation today obviously has changed that for us. It was different back then. But nonetheless, he kept within a small geographical scope and prior to his departure in Matthew 28 he has these amazing words we all know them everyone knows them Matthew 28 and verse 16 it gives us some insight into how the disciples were thinking sometimes we have to glean these nuggets out of the Bible and um, here the disciples the Bible tells us that some of them are doubting so, and I, I've looked this up in the Greek so I know 
what the doubt was about. Some of them are doubting this is actually Jesus. Now, how, how is that so? I mean, there's 11 of them left. One of them's dead, obviously. There may have been others following them to the mountain. Who knows? But how can it be when you've seen the miracles, you've been with them, you know his voice, you, it, it, but they still, some of them doubted it, and the Bible says. Nevertheless, when they saw him, they worshipped him, the Bible tells us. I think one of the possible issues that they would have been considering at the time, I know I would have, was what's changed now? How do we follow a resurrected Christ? What's going to be different than before? What's going to be different in our commission now? In, in verse 16 to verse 17 of this Matthew's discourse here, it says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus has appointed them or told them to go to. Verse 17, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Some doubted. No doubt, you know, we're after the crucifixion, troubled with the possibilities of what lay ahead and what's going to happen. They find themselves face to face with the one that had given them a purpose, but there is a hesitancy now about what that purpose is going to be. The Bible tells us some doubted. That word doubt, there's a word distazo, meaning they wavered. They wavered. Used only twice in the New Testament, by the way, that particular word. The other times it's used is when Peter was called to walk on water. And he doubted the Lord. He wavered just for a minute. They hesitated to believe this was their Lord. Verse 17 says, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. To set their minds at rest, Jesus reminds them who's in charge. Verse 18, all power. All power has been given unto me, he says. He's trying to put their minds at rest here. Both in heaven and earth, therefore go into all the nations and preach the gospel, preach the good news, and then he disappears before them. Verse 19, go and make disciples of all nations. You ever thought about, I mean, we read that, we think, oh yeah, that's the commission, great commission. You ever thought about it from their perspective? Mm-hmm. They've only traveled the small geographical area, and now they've been told to go into all the world. Mm-hmm. And they're probably saying, the world? <laughs> We haven't been outside of Israel. What are you talking about? And you want us to go out there and do this? I think often we give, you know, we, we give little thought to the overwhelming task that Jesus has just laid on them. But the words the Lord left with them in verse 20 is their saving comfort. And I want you to get this today because this is what I grab hold of this week myself. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the age. Hold fast to that this week in whatever your experiences are. I am with you always. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter whether you walk into a building full of demonic powers. Jesus said he is with you always. And he said all power has been given unto me. Therefore go with it. So wherever you go you take that power with you. I am with you always even unto the ends of the age. In other words until I come back I'm with you. You can't see me in person anymore. You can't touch me anymore. But by faith, you will exercise this now. I am with you always. And he leaves no doubt of his presence being with them. 
And I think that's a powerful verse we need to hold on to in our life when we get discouraged. He is with us always. What comforting words each one of us need to settle in my mind. I am with you always. Despite where you are, despite who you are with, I am with you. Hmm? And some people have a greater consciousness of the devil in his presence than they do of the Lord in his presence. And that's really, really sad because we don't serve the devil, we serve a risen Savior and a God that has conquered the works of the enemy, a defeated enemy. The Bible says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You ever feel something's just too difficult? You ever feel the task is too great? You ever just don't understand what's going on? Remind yourself, greater is he that's in you. I know we know this, but we need to be reminded this. David had to remind himself, this great man of God, greater is he that's in me. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Don't blame yourself when other people fail you or, or try and make you feel guilty or manipulate you or whatever. Just know that he is with you. Amen. We need to trust God is in control and not the devil. Yes. Amen. Not the devil. The devil is not in control. There's nothing in your life that is greater than Jesus. He dwells within you. There is nothing greater in my life than Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. If we just get that revelation, we'll have a little devil and a big God. And that's about how it should be. A little devil and a big God. Amen. Jesus is with you. He said, all power has been given. We may not have the answers to our problems. We may not see the solution. But he, he does and he's going to bring it to pass. Do not allow discouragement to hold fast to you. Amen. So I had to get myself by the ear this week and tell myself to shut up and stop speaking negative and start speaking the word of God. And that's what we need to do. Stop glorifying the devil by speaking negative. And start speaking the word of God and take authority over the enemy who's already been defeated. Stop saying, I can't, and start saying, I can. Jesus is with me. Jesus is with you. Amen? All power is in His hand. The same Jesus that conquered death. The same Jesus that conquered the enemy is with you, is with me. The same Jesus that was in the fire with those three Hebrew children. And then Nebuchadnezzar looks in there and he says, I can see another one in there. Who's that for? That's the same Jesus that's with you and with Amen. me. It doesn't matter what we're going through. It doesn't matter what the furnace is in our life. He is with you. I thought I only threw three in that fire. <laughs> I can see a force. <laughs> uh, that's what we need to have eyes for. Yes. Jesus. Yes. Not yes. the devil. Jesus. Yes. <laughs> and he said he looks like the Son of God. I've got a correction today for, for, for Nebuchadnezzar. No, it doesn't look like the Son of God. It was the Son of God. It was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. This is the same Son of God that's in you, that's in me. Amen. I'm preaching to myself here. You need to preach to yourself. Amen. It's true. It's true. The problems in our lives sometimes seem so big. The challenges seem so insurmountable. And yet, on your own, there's no hope. There's little hope. We Come on. What can we do? Huh? What can we do? But with Him, we can do all things. With Him, we can do all things. That's true. I remember when we started building the second building at the orphanage, everyone, everyone, even my staff told me, don't do it. It's going to cost too much. And this is true. This is a true story. I had enough in the bank account to build one pillar. <laughs> That's not very much money, right? One pillar 
in a building that needed more than 60 pillars. That's just pillars, and then we had to build it. But I had this conviction inside that God had told me to do it. It's a big building, 60-bed facility. God, you told me to do this. So I took what I had, and I instructed our manager, build one pillar. <laughs> you can imagine the conversation that came back to me. We built that pillar, and for more than two months, it sat there on its own, looking lonely. <laughs> and nothing happened. And of course, comments started to happen. Well. What happened in the end? Yeah, that's a good question, Eddie, because today that facility caters for 60 children and 11 staff. And oh, it's well, finished. <laughs> it's finished. And, you know, God met every need and more on that. Just because we don't have the means doesn't mean we haven't heard from God. I knew Jesus was with me. My faith back then was so strong. I knew he was with me. And so I said, let's go ahead and do it. Last, last week, I think I should mention that we had 50 parents of some of the children we now reach out to in the community give their hearts to the Lord. See, step by step, step by step, and we start to see the fruit. So number one, Jesus is with us. Jesus is with us. All power has been given to him, so it's given to us. In the 33rd chapter of Deuteronomy, I'm going to wrap this up soon. Moses leaves a blessing for the people because he's about to die. It's one of the most beautiful chapters in the Old Covenant, if you haven't read it. And he's talking about the goodness of God. And he's talking about how wonderful God is and how great he's been for the nation of Israel. And he talks about these experiences. that He calls them mountaintop experiences in one version of the Bible. And, of course, so much happened on the mountaintops in the Old Covenant. Moses speaks of how God from the mountaintops visited his people. How on Mount Sinai God gave the law to his people. How on Mount Carmel he visited the people with fire. How on Mount Horeb Moses encountered the burning bush himself. How on Mount Nebo that Moses looked out and he saw the promised land ahead of him. So Moses is reciting these great experiences that have been on mountaintops. How it was on Mount Moriah where God met with Abraham and Abraham was going to Isaac his son, um, offer his son Isaac on an altar and God intervenes. So Moses is reciting these wonderful, wonderful stories. And there is no doubt God is a God of the mountaintops and we love to preach those things but there's something in one of the verses in that chapter of chapter 33 verse 27 that stood out to me as I read it this week it balances this whole thing out of life because life is not always about mountaintop experiences mm. although we'd like it to be that way although some preachers would preach it that way the truth is there is a balance and here is the balance in verse 27. The eternal God is your refuge. Mm. And underneath you are his everlasting arms. Underneath you are the everlasting arms of God. He will thrust down the enemy before you. When times don't seem so good, just know this. Underneath you are the everlasting arms of God Amen. holding you up. Strong's Concordance for the word underneath uses the word taka, T-A-K-A. Underneath meaning the bottom. God is not only the God of the mountain tops. God is a God of the bottom also. He's underneath you. He's on top of you. He's got you embraced in his arms. I may fall. I may go right to rock bottom. But know this. His everlasting arms are underneath you. The Bible says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. 
And if I just look around, I will see He is a God who is on top. But He's also a God that's underneath me, holding me up. Amen. At the times when I need Him. God doesn't drop those He's holding up. He's not like me. When I play cricket, I drop the ball all the time. God doesn't drop the ball. He doesn't drop us. When I'm feeling at my lowest, I need to remind myself, straighten up yourself. Straighten up yourself. Jesus is with me. He's in charge. He won't let me go. He won't let go. And if you take my house, you take my car, you take everything away from me, nothing has changed because he's still got a hold of me. Amen. We need to remember that. 